Coming up on Kentucky Afield, we are in Grayson County, visiting with a man who is an artist, an outdoorsman, and a friend of Archery Hall of Famer, Fred Bear. He's the reason I got into bow hunting. I used to play Fred Bear. Then, learn how your favorite species of fish maintain a healthy population. That's a, probably a seven or eight pound walleye, okay. right? And Chad celebrates Father's Day with both his father and his son. All next on Kentucky Afield. Yeah, we got one. Sweet. Got a muskrat? Yeah. Good job. <laughs> What do you know about that, man? That's a good fish, man. Nice male, small mouth. Healthy, pretty color. Cody, here. Find us one more good fish, Cody. As biologists, we, we catch ducks and we place bands on them. And it's just a really excellent place to see cottonmouths. I like it. What do you think? Like bull. That was pretty fun. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. This weekend, we celebrate Father's Day. As outdoors men and women, most of us have very vivid memories of our time outdoors. Here's a story to help you always remember to cherish those moments. Chad, this is the ultimate widescreen TV yeah. right here. And, <laughs> it's, no and it's 360 and it's three dimensional. And it has scent. <laughs> it has scent, hills to the senses and all levels, and you just need to take it in. Fred Perry once said that the woods are a friendly place. And he didn't say, throw all caution to wind, go running through the woods and you're gonna be safe. But it's a friendly place in that it will accept you to a point, and you can learn how to acclimate in and, and study everything and how it interacts. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with Fred Bear. I mean, Fred Bear is the icon when it comes to bow hunting. Yeah, the father of bow hunting. I, I mean, he's known by a lot of things. Uh, I, you know, the gentleman woodsman, uh, the man with the Borsalino hat, mm -hmm. uh, the father of bow hunting, all those things fit. And he was a wonderful human being. He's the reason I got into bow hunting. I used to play Fred Bear. Well, let me face it, when I was a young guy in college, I'd put the hat on and, <laughs> and, and I know what I was doing, but I would carry the, the Fred Bear bow, you know, and I would go into the woods and I would, I would be Fred Bear. Here is a fedora hat that Fred Bear. He did, he gave me that gave you. back in 83. He signed it, and uh, he was aware of uh, our high school bow hunting club. This was sort of his donation and, uh, and uh, offer of good luck. Uh, to the kids and he said, you know, uh, the kids want to wear this thing, uh, uh, make sure that they can pop it on their head and go bow hunting and, and uh, maybe they'll get a little, little extra So magic you there. actually loaned this hat out to students of yours at Grayson County High School to go hunt and they brought it back, right? They actually did. <laughs> and uh, here's the proof right here. Uh, you can see it's, it's quite worn. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way Fred wanted it. And we actually made Fred honorary member of our high school bow club. And in exchange for this, I gave him one of our caps. Oh, that's which cool. Which wasn't quite the same. It was, <laughs> it was a bill cap with a logo on it, but uh, he wore it proudly. That says a lot about Fred Bear, yourself, and, and your students. They, they respected the piece that they all brought it They back. knew who he was. That is great. Fred showed me that there was more to bow hunting than taking world record animals. Well, and now, just a little bit of time I've spent talking to you, hearing your passion of bow hunting, seeing what you're doing here with your piece of property, and now looking at some of your artwork. For you, it doesn't have to be hunting. No. It's all about the emotions and the feelings that you get and trying to share that with other people. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
my training when I was in art school at Murray State, I majored in painting. Mm -hmm. So I look at things as a visual artist and I carry the camera and when I'm on a hunt is when usually I shoot these things. I usually don't go out and say, I'm gonna shoot a cover mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. It's in my backpack, the camera is. And if something clicks and if something maybe I've just experienced, I just repeat it, I set it up and I capture it. You're not seeing people's faces on a lot of your photography, right? Correct. And you're not seeing the game a lot of times. It's the pursuit. When I go out and I capture these things, some of the images are similar to the images that, that moved me when I was a young bow hunter. There's, there's something about the, being a predator mm -hmm. and being part of it, the scheme of things and slipping through the woods and trying to approach an animal without the animal knowing that you're there. It's natural and uh, there's something about it uh, that's, that's very satisfying. Well, and I know that my amount of time in the woods and my passion for it, I feel like I'm a piece of that puzzle. Mm -hmm. When I'm in the woods, I feel like I'm right where I need to be. That's right. So Gary, I couldn't help walking by and noticing these arrows stuck up here in this tree. I'm sure that you have some meaning here. Absolutely. When we bought the property, we erected this uh, game pole mm -hmm. and uh, established a little camp area here. I told my son-in-law, whenever you take your first deer on our property with a bow, take your arrow and lash it to this tree and I'll do the same and it'll serve as long as uh, it lasts yeah. <laughs> as a memento and a memory. You remember exactly what that deer was, what kind of deer you took on this? Yeah, this it was, it was, it, it, it was. I do, I do remember it wasn't far, it was taken on the ground. So just one glance at that arrow, yeah, it, it bring, all comes back. Brings it back, yeah. That's pretty cool. Well, I know you got some more grandsons on the way and some granddaughters. Hopefully there's a whole pile of arrows lashed yeah, to that tree Yeah, we've got a pretty good sized years. tree here. I think we've got room for a few more arrows. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Got some deer tracks here. This little blind sitting here. <laughs> My grandson, who's five years old, mm -hmm. he refers this as William's blind because his name is William. <laughs> and this is where he will tell you that he learned to tie a knot. Oh, really? We were setting up a blind, uh, anticipating seeing some turkeys. And I'm, you know, working on tying it off on some of the other trees. And, and I looked over and here's my little five-year-old grandson and he's wrapping vigorously and somehow he pulls it through and it catches and it's solid and he looks up and he kind of does his hands like this and he says look pal Paul I tied a knot <laughs> he refers this as his blind where he learned how to tie a knot so it's probably going to just decay over time <laughs> if that is enough to keep him excited to keep him coming back to the stand and, the, and getting in this blind who knows 15 years you put the time in this might be the place to be there's a story behind everything you know One of the things that's really important about some of the covers is I've been able to use some people I know on the covers. Probably my most important cover was I was able to use my father. And my father passed away in 2013, but he was my hunting companion. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the guy that sat with me watching those Fred Bear films. Mm -hmm. He was the guy that uh, went with me to Alabama to uh, experience the Fred Bear bow hunting school together. And uh, I was able to take him out into the field one day and uh, he didn't always remember things the way, of course, he once had remembered. But I took him to places that he should have been somewhat familiar with. We'd camped there, we'd deer hunted there, here in the county. And he carried a bow and he wore a bull plaid shirt and an old 1940 fedora that belonged to him. And I shot him for a cover. And this is rare for you because you can actually see a person's face, which you didn't do quite often, That's right? something that I, I rarely do, but I wanted uh, people that knew him to, uh, to know it was him. Mm -hmm. But that's back when my dad was, was sick. And I did a story for the same magazine called uh, Reflections. Mm -hmm. And it was about how I took him out that day and he remembered, he reflected mm -hmm. in ways that we didn't know he was still capable of remembering. And this is at a point where he didn't even know my name. Mm -hmm. He would refer to me as one of his, meaning he's my son. And I heard, I got more input from that piece than any other thing I've ever done. Because people who had had similar problems in their family being out in the woods with family members and, and or people you're just close to, you'll never forget those. 
you know, you can, you can be at some point in your life where you can't get out anymore. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or, you know, whether you're sick or not, you, maybe you just physically can't, can't do the things that you used to do, but you can still have those memories and they're precious. And so, you know, you never know when you're gonna make a memory that's gonna be something that stays with you, becomes uh, something extra special, not only to you, but those that you shared it with. And the outdoors is just a place to, for that to happen so, so often. You obviously have a passion about the outdoors and archery. And it really kind of makes me take a step back and, and think, man, you really need to take uh, advantage of these opportunities. And, and, and you do a great job of documenting it as well. Well, there's, there's a history to, to bow hunting that I, I think people would uh, definitely uh, benefit from knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a rich history. It might enrich the experience of just going into the woods today as a modern bow hunter, uh, having, a, having a sense of what, who's walked those paths before you. The final story is enjoy the experience. It's not all about the harvest, the take. Absolutely Enjoy not. every hunt, and if you come in frustrated, you probably have something you could take from that, that, ex that day and think, wow, I spent a day bow hunting. That was a good day. Absolutely. Not all the fish species here in the state of Kentucky are able to reproduce naturally. That's where the Department of Fish and Wildlife comes in to make sure that we have a fishable population of these species. Oh my goodness. That's probably a seven or eight pound walleye, right? Oh yeah, female for sure. That's a really nice fish. We're here with the fish truck today. People see fish like this being put back into the lake. Their initial thought is probably that we raise these fish. That's not necessarily the truth, is it? Oh no, not at all. So not what's going on here today? Yeah, we're actually getting to put back walleye that we'd collected for hatchery purposes and put them back into the lake. So we had 90-something walleye, all pretty good-sized fish, that were all returned back here in the Green River. Those fish were actually taken from this lake, or the tailwaters right here Correct. close by, not that long ago. How long do we keep those fish? If they're in the hatchery for about a month, that's about the, you know, a month or less. So, and, it, and, and at times it can be even shorter than that. So when someone's out here fishing and they see a shocking boat come by and a fish truck there, and they see you taking pretty good sized fish out of the lake or out of the tailwater or whatever, why is it so important? The times that we take fish for broodstock is, is generally for fisheries that can't support themselves naturally through reproduction. Just like walleye in Green River Lake, Cumberland or Laurel or Nolan, they may go through the motions and try and produce eggs and of course do that, but the survival up to a fry or to an age of fish that's one year old is so low that it could never support or sustain a, you know, a fishable population. So walk us through the process. Once they take one of these broodstocks from the lake back to the hatchery, tell us how this process works. Oftentimes they, they'll hold those fish and wait till they maybe get the number that they need and sometimes the fish dictate that schedule for them and they, may, and they may need to go ahead and start spawning those fish and getting them to produce the eggs and they'll hold those eggs in the hatchery for a time and, and once they hatch off, you know, hold them in the hatchery and grow them out to a fry size and then put them out into the ponds to grow out. So Eric, tell me about some other species of fish that we, we pull broodstock from the lakes and then put back in. Musky again is one another one of those. If we didn't stock them, we wouldn't have them in the lakes. Um, same for something like sawguy. I mean, we don't have any sawguy in our district, but I, I know we're doing a research project with some stocking sawguy in some of our smaller impoundments. Again, that's a collection of sauger. Um, and crossing those with walleye to get that job done. Green has got the reputation over the last few years of being a really good bass fishery and a great crappie fishery. Are there any stockings taking place on bass and crappie? No, that's all self-sustaining. So yeah, that, and that's the way we want it. Stocking's a great tool when we need it to, to produce a fishery, but most of, most of our fisheries take care of themselves through natural reproduction, and that's crappie and bass. Not very often do we need to supplement. 
And there's a Mandy. What we just saw is not typical for when people see a fish truck come up, is it? No, it's not. Normally when we you see a fish truck come up, they're stocking little bitty fish, inch and a half, two inch fish. So today, you know, people got to see that when we're launching their boat, see some brood stock walleye being put back into the lake. Looks like you got a male and a female in there. <laughs> One of each. That right there could have produced 50, 60,000 fish potentially. We're happy to have what we've got with the walleye systems with the Erie strain. And I'm glad to see that we're putting those fish back. Once we've used them to, to produce the eggs, it's good to see that they're back in our fisheries. Oh yeah. Thank you for the work you do as an avid fisherman. I'd really like to see these fish back in the lake. Yeah, thanks to the hatchery staff. They do the, they do the lion's share of that work yeah. for us. So yeah, hats off to them. Now let's check in and see who's catching what and where in this week's fishing report. This is Jeff Crosby with the Central District Fishing Report. Water temperatures at our area lakes are running in the upper 70s to lower 80s. Good catches of panfish, bluegill and shellcracker are being taken at Beaver, Corinth, Elmer and McNeely Lakes. Caught on a variety of lures such as crickets, millworms and redworms. You'll want to concentrate your efforts on pockets in the vegetation or along the edge of the vegetation. Bass fishing at our area lakes continue to be good. Taylorsville, Harrington, Gist Creek, Bullock Pen, and Kincaid Lakes. Try crankbaits, spinnerbaits, or swim jigs. And finally, ponds and lakes that are part of the Fishing and Neighborhoods program have recently been stocked with channel catfish and hybrid bluegill. This is Rob Rowland in the Northwestern Fishery District. Rough River Lake and Nolan River Lake are both at summer pool. Fish are kind of moving from their spring into their summertime pattern. Anglers have been doing well on bass fishing at both reservoirs especially using Carolina or shot rigged plastic baits. Bluegill are being caught around the five foot depth range, fishing around the more rocky, steeper banks, using crickets, red worms, as well as some of the small spinner baits. Crappie are also settling into their summertime pattern and finding brush piles in the 12 to 15 foot depth range and fishing around those with some jigs and minnows produced several nice crappie in the last week or so. Be safe on the water and always wear your life jackets. In western Kentucky, down at Kentucky and Barkley Lakes, starting into some summertime fishing patterns. The water temperatures reached 80 degrees. That means blue cats out on the river channel. That means Carolina, Texas rig worms for bass out on the ledges. The fish are really going to start moving out towards the ledges where there's some current, where there's some bait fish. In the tailwaters, this is the time of year that the tailwaters below Kentucky and Barkley Dam always get really good for white bass, striped bass, and hybrids. Using live bait is best. You can go down there and catch some skipjack herring, bait up with those, also catch your big blue cats. Well, this is Paul Reister, and I hope you find a good day to go fishing. I can't think of a better way to spend Father's Day weekend than on the lake pan fishing with my son and my dad. This is good looking spots, isn't it? Oh yeah. They're not catching that well. Papa. Hmm? Not two turtles. Yeah, looks like a mama and a little one, don't it? Uh-huh. If you don't get to catching some fish, we might have to eat them worms. Supposed to be high in protein. Oh, look, Leo. What? Here, catch this one. You got one, Leo. Let's see what he's Oh, got. you got him up here. Raise him up. Oh. He's a throwback, but he's big. He's a big fun one to I'll catch, throw him one. back. I want to throw him back. Now, squeeze. Squeeze hard till you get him over the boat. Now take him to the Good boat. Good job, Leo. In. Yeah. He you know, Dad, some of my earliest memories have been fishing, you and I fishing together. I unfortunately uh, never got a chance to meet your dad as he passed away before I was born. But uh, can you remember stories of you guys fishing at a real young age? Oh, yeah. Dad, 
first started fishing back then at uh, Pay Lakes. Of course, I was raised in Fairdale and they had big horn, just a Pay Lake. And then uh, I think the state, it might have been the fish department, uh, put in Tom Wallace. And I never will forget, he'd go up there and take me up there. And of course, when they first stocked it, you could catch quite a few fish. That's the first fish in that in the Pay Lakes until they bought down at Nolan. I remember sitting on the dock and they were still building the dam. That's how early they bought down there. They were working on the road that goes over it. Here you go. I got it. I got it. Really? I believe he's bigger, Leo. Oh, he is. Now, that's more like it. Now, can we keep it? That's a dandy. Let's keep him. That's more like it. Can we keep him? Went to the bug here. Can we keep him? You want? You know where you put him? Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Yeah. We're a family that have always fished together. I mean, you only have one sibling, a brother, and he's he's about as avid as you can be oh. hunting and fishing both. And I remember as a family just all piling in that little cabin, and I mean extended family. Your mom and your mom, and, and you know, of course your dad had passed away, so your stepdad and cousins and uncles and everybody, we just all piled in there. And if there was an open spot on the floor, you took it if you wanted to stay at the lake, and that's just how summers were. It's huge to keep the family close, fishing. It's probably been the biggest part of uh, all of our lives. And it probably helped keep me out of trouble. Oh, look here, Leo. Put that new bait on there and look what happened. Hey. Must be all about the legs. Are we, gonna, are we gonna keep it? I believe that one's probably big enough. You open it up? Depends on if you want a fish taco. That's a good one, Dad. Got him. Nice job, Leo. Hey, Leo. Nice no, job. How many have you caught? Have you caught them all? No, we just need one more. We just need one more fish. Okay. One more. That'll be good. So Papa and Mama can have a Father's Day fish fry. Chad probably gets that love of fishing on us. My dad, which his grandfather he never met. I can remember that was back in the late 50s, early 60s, whenever they built that lake. He would fish all day, and that was back when you just sit on the front of the boat and just oared it. You didn't have trolling motors. And just a little old uncomfortable aluminum boat, he'd fish all day, so. If there's such a thing as passing it on, he did. Are you going to get this fish in the boat? Good Lord, that's a big one. Mercy Leo! Yeah, we're keeping it as a keeper. That's a taco. Yeah, it's a keeper, too. Man, I thought that was a red ear, but it's not. It's just a It's dang. a keeper. Now, that is a trophy bluegill. I Boy, think we're proud of you, buddy. You did good. That might be the biggest bluegill pepper I've ever seen. Oh, <laughs> that's like probably the keepers. I thought he was a nice one. I believe this is a fish taco, buddy. Mm-hmm. We're going in. All right. Leo. Raise it up. Who's is bigger? Pepper's or your daddy's? Pepper's. No, this one's bigger. Uh oh, all right. I'll tell you what, it wouldn't take many of that size to have a mess. I hope he don't eat the rest of them. <laughs> now let's see who else is out there having fun as we check out this week's ones that didn't get away. Here we have three-year-old Natalie Basanta with her first fish ever caught at Lake Mingo in Nicholasville. Not sure whether she's happy about it. <laughs> Congratulations. Here we have L.B. Gaston of Marion, Kentucky with his 23 pound Tom taking on his 83rd birthday. That's how you spend a birthday right there. Congratulations. Here we have a nice turkey taken by Brandon Schott of Bath County, Kentucky. 
Congratulations. Here we have Lucas Fortwingler with his first turkey ever. Congratulations. Hope everyone enjoys this Father's Day weekend and find some time for loved ones. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission to thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.